Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 4204 in the name of Liam MacArthur on no to nuisance calls. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I would now call on Liam MacArthur to open the debate. Mr MacArthur, you have seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Presiding Officer for the bit of uh, pre-advertising uh, for this debate. In bringing the debate to the Chamber this evening, I am painfully aware that it will strike many as a bit rich. Uh, politicians complaining about those who make nuisance calls. Uh, like most MSPs, I imagine I have played my part in interrupting uh, the odd family mealtime over the years, and not just in the MacArthur household. But the issues underlying the campaign are serious and deserve proper recognition. And so I warmly congratulate the Sunday Post for uh, the leading role it has played in highlighting the problem of nuisance calls and texts. Uh, my Liberal Democrat colleague, Mike Crockert, has spearheaded the campaign at Westminster, but I felt it was important that this parliament uh, had its voice heard in saying no uh, to nuisance calls. I'm therefore grateful uh, to the very many colleagues who have signed uh, my motion uh, and those who are staying around to participate uh, this evening. A show of support that I think demonstrates the cross-party nature of the campaign and the nationwide extent of the problems created by nuisance calls and texts. The aim of the campaign must be to bring an end or at the very least significantly reduce the number of these calls and texts that are made and I'm hopeful that this can be achieved. In just over a month, more than 11,000 people have signed up to the campaign, testimony, I think, to the strength of feeling there is about this issue. Many of my constituents in Orkney have got in touch to tell me how fed up they are of nuisance calls to their mobiles, home phones and to family members, not to mention the deluge of unsolicited texts. Cold calling has been an issue raised at constituency surgeries uh, for years. In the past, I remember the energy companies were guilty of overstepping the mark in a bid to persuade the customers to shift suppliers. Thanks uh, to many local campaigns, most of the big six energy companies have now stopped doorstep selling. But progress elsewhere has been slow. I recently met a constituent whose elderly mother, a dementia sufferer, was repeatedly called by one company and badgered to take out a broadband package. She finally relented and signed up for the expensive offer, despite not even having a computer. It took months to rectify the situation, to get the money reimbursed. But this case at least ended positively. Many, many thousands more do not. The bottom line is that people shouldn't have to put up with this menace, which puts many vulnerable and elderly people at risk of fraud. The calls and texts can seem threatening and intimidating. To many, they are just as worrying as if there were someone to, to appear on their, on their doorstep uh, unannounced and uninvited. Astonishingly, there, there were 650 million silent calls made in the UK last year alone. This works out to around 50 nuisance calls a year to each Scot. Across the UK, 3 million people will be scammed out of an average of around £800 this year as a result of obtrusive calls. Something must be done about this as it seems clear that the measures currently in place to shield people from nuisance calls are not up to the job. Like many, I know that I haven't had a fall in the last five years, or at least not one that was down to some fairly calamitous defending on the football field. I am not entitled uh, to PPI compensation, and I certainly don't want a payday loan. But that doesn't stop the offers coming thick and fast. Even uh, for those who've signed up to the telephone preference service, it seems there is no escape. According to Ofcom, complaints to the TPS about unwanted marketing calls jumped to almost 10,000 for the month of July. This compares to uh, just over 3,200 in December last year. In an online poll of over 4,000 individuals for which magazine, 76% of respondents said that despite signing up to the TPS, they still received lots of nuisance calls. Only 1% rated the service as excellent and most said that it made no difference at all. This certainly will, yes. Maureen Watt. Thank William MacArthur for giving way. I think lots of people do know about the telephone preference service, but my understanding is it only relates to calls generated in this country, and it's actually the call prevention registry that people need to phone up the 0800 652 number to get overseas calls stopped. Liam MacArthur. I thank Maureen Watt for that point. I think uh, it, it is a very relevant one. I think it, it, it demonstrates the uh, extent to which um, increasing awareness of the that can be taken 
um, is, is certainly part of the solution, but I still believe uh, that more uh, needs to be done in terms of uh, cracking down on this phenomenon. As the Scottish uh, Sunday Post concluded recently, it's clear from the overwhelming response we have had from our readers this problem plagues our daily lives. And yet, regardless of asking for the companies to stop and sometimes taking steps to halt them, the onslaught continues. Uh, the will is there from people to put an end to this once and for all. Now is the time for the government to act on that will and strengthen existing legislation. The readers of the Sunday Post and the thousands who have backed the campaign want their voice to be heard. People feel under siege and it's time that we gave them the tools to fight back. I believe that it's time for the Information Commissioner's powers uh, to be strengthened, to take in all forms of unsolicited contact and for there to be a single point of contact for any individual wishing to protect their privacy from unwanted calls, texts, emails, etc. Yesterday's announcement by the Information Commissioner's Office that it was issuing, issuing fines of over a quarter of a million to two illegal marketeers who distributed millions of spam texts is evidence that where it can, it will act. But from the figures I've already quoted, it is clear that the ICO still lacks the tools it needs for the job. Joint working between Scotland's two governments can see progress made, and I hope that the Minister will now agree to work with his counterpart at Westminster in putting in place measures that will protect millions of Scots from nuisance calls. Deputy Presiding Officer, I simply don't understand why we continue to allow this to happen, why we are so permissive about our telephone's contact. Uh, if this were happening face to face, if payday loan sharks or PPI insurance litigators were knocking uh, on the doors of the elderly, the vulnerable in our communities, then either running away or bullying them into making claims, we'd rightly be up in arms. Just because the constant barracking, intimidation and hectoring happens after pushing buttons on a phone rather than pushing a doorbell does not make it okay or any less frightening to the vulnerable people across Scotland. And yet that is the everyday reality for too many of them. It cannot continue. It must stop. And I thank those, all those who have shown their support uh, for this campaign and for my motion. I look forward very much to hearing what other colleagues across the chamber have to say, and in particular to the comments of the Minister. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks. I now call on James Dornan to be followed by Mark Griffin. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'd like to thank Liam MacArthur uh, for bringing this to the Chamber and also the Sunday Post for the campaign that they've been running on it. It's good to have recognition of this problem which affects members of every constituency across the country, including my own. In my view, nuisance calls can be broken down into three broad types. There's a persistent, annoying calls trying to sell something, impacting in your busy lives or your valuable personal time. There's the alarming calls where a caller tries to frighten you into buying something. For example, the call will start with, this is an urgent message, which is clearly targeted at getting you to believe there's something wrong. I've been contacted by family in my constituency complaining that this happened to them, and they thought it was bad news about a sick loved one who were waiting on news about, but of course it was about PPI, which didn't even affect them in the household. There appears to be a willingness now among a number of companies to spread fear and alarm if they think it will end up in a sale. I find this astonishing and deeply depressing. Fraudulent calls another forum where the caller is just simply trying to rip you off. These can take the form of claiming you have an entitlement to some sort of refund, but they will need to purchase a voucher or give a code in order to redeem your refund. Citizens Advice has had a number of such complaints. For example, uh, the report of one client whose elderly mother received a cold call to say she was entitled to a tax rebate of £8,000. She was told to get it. She had to buy a cash voucher and hand it over in advance. Another one was a, a client who received a cold call from a claims handling company claiming they would get her £500 in refunded bank charges if she bought a cash voucher for £200. The company, when contacted, told her not to speak to any bank officials before they made the, she finalised this. One of the disturbing things about these calls, as has already been mentioned, is that they often involve someone calling around to the person's house. So not only can they contact you by phone, but they may also end up coming to your door. And if not, then the threat of that hangs over you. Two other forms of nuisance calls are claiming that something's wrong. I mean, I recently received a call saying there was a problem with my Microsoft software and the computer and I stayed in the line. I don't have a clue. Uh, and if I'd stayed in the line and logged on to my computer, the, this person would have helped me to resolve this serious problem. Of course, all they were looking for was access to my computer, access to my personal important information, and then they would have used it for their own nefarious devices. And then there are calls seeking your, 
seeking your personal, you don't want it on my computer, seeking, <laughs> seeking your personal and banking information, they will allow the caller to access your accounts and take whatever they like. Now, there are a number of ways to deal with nuisance calls, and some of them have already been mentioned. You can list your number X directory, get caller display, so you can choose what calls to answer, and there's a TPS, which should stop unwanted sales and marketing calls, but as my colleague Maureen Watt just said, doesn't cover them all. There are, the, there are the police for malicious harassing and malicious phone calls, and there is a myriad of telephone providers, each of which has a separate number. But they can be complicated for, far too, for too many, and unfortunately, they don't always work. And very often, the people most affected by these nuisance calls are the desperate and vulnerable. The very same group that is less able to tackle the complex and confusing systems that currently exist to tackle this problem. That is why I too welcome the idea of a single simple point of contact. One which could either answer your concern or give you the correct number to contact to get your problem solved or your mind eased. Clearly more must be done to simplify the means of addressing this growing problem and this sounds like a good starting point. The other parts of the puzzle are legislation and enforcement. Unfortunately, the Scottish Parliament does not yet have the powers to legislate to bring an end to these obscene practices. Until such times as we do, I ask the Minister to contact the Westminster Government, working closely with them, urging them to bring in stronger legislation and to ensure that any existing legislation is fully enforced. Thank you. Many thanks. Now I call on Mark Griffin to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, President Officer, and I congratulate Liam MacArthur for securing the debate tonight. Um, even if the timing is slightly unfortunate for some of us a, of a particular football and persuasion. Um, and for a split second, I thought I was maybe going to get updates here, but I realised that was a, a, a far more important parliamentary procedure earlier on. Um, but I signed the motion and I stayed behind today to take part in the debate, um, in part because I get numerous calls um, every day from companies who tell me I'm owed thousands in missile payment protection insurance or that they can magically write off all my debts, or that they can get me compensation for an accident that I've never had. Those calls are the nuisance calls that I think we all get frustrated with, but as I said, that's only part of the reason I signed the motion. There are much worse operators than the PPI teams calling up and down the country, as highlighted um, by Mr Dornan. And just over a year ago, I had an elderly constituent uh, call me up almost in tears, about a contract they thought they had committed to over the phone. That was from an alarm company who had called and told them about various break-ins in the local area and that they would be happy to come and fit the alarm for them free of charge to give them peace of mind. Now, the salesman went over and over in graphic detail about just what had happened to other properties in the area, what the people living in those homes felt like after they'd been burgled and while I've got no doubt that being the victim of a burglary would be extremely upsetting and lead to people feeling unsafe in their own homes, it just doesn't justify representatives from these sale com sales companies using those sort of scare stories to push their own products. Now, after a long phone call, my constituent eventually agreed to the free, free alarm installation and a date was agreed for it to go ahead. Um, and just at the end of the conversation, the salesperson dropped into the conversation that the engineer would call around next week and he'd bring the paperwork so that she could sign the annual maintenance contract, um, which would run up into uh, the hundreds of pounds every year. And the, the conversation ended quickly. The, the constituent called me, worried that the engineer would turn up at her door, um, install the new alarm, and that she would have to go ahead with this expensive maintenance contract which she, which she couldn't afford. I was able to reassure her that she hadn't committed to anything and that she'd be able to just call the company back and forcefully cancel any appointment that she had with her and for them to remove her details from her records. Unfortunately, that did resolve the problem, but only after considerable, considerable upset for the constituent and who knows how many others the company had been calling and perhaps even went ahead with the arrangement. A matter of days later, I happened to receive the, the call from the very same company offering me the same free alarm, saying I should take advantage because of the increasing number of break-ins in Moan Street. Now, I know my neighbours quite well. I think I would have picked up if there had been any break-ins in my street, but it just so happened that I was still a councillor at the time, and I'm not sure about any other former councillors, but we used to get monthly updates on the crime that happened in our own ward, and so I could open a report and look at it and say, well, actually, 
I can't see these crimes that you have pointed to. Where's, where's your information coming from? Can I speak to your manager? Quickly, the phone was put down on me. But luckily enough, I was able to get the, the information, pass it on to Trade and Standards. We um, were able to pursue it and happily saw them named and shamed in the daily record maybe about a year ago. So that, that seemed to, to their demise. But those types of calls that, that go beyond that nuisance uh, can cause genuine upset and worry or could persuade people to waste money on expensive services that were never as urgently needed as was suggested. Those are the types of calls I would like to see screened and in line with the motion would welcome a single simple point of contact for any individual wishing to pre protect their privacy from unwanted calls, texts, faxes and emails. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. Now call on Graham Day to be followed by Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In the rising to speak, I should declare an interest, and it goes beyond acknowledging that I uh, worked for the publisher of the Sunday Post for many years, uh, the Sunday Post whose role in highlighting this problem is, is to be commended. Um, I, in common with other members, such as Mark Griffin, have been and continue to be a victim of nuisance calls, both through my constituency office and my home number. Uh, my constituency office has for several months been bombarded as often as three, four, five times a day with automated PPI-related calls. And in common with many people, my home phone number seems to be a magnet for unwelcome calls. Generally speaking, it's the standard stuff, double glazing kitchens, changing energy supplier, or that friendly person who just happens to be conducting a quick survey in my area. Or at least that was until last weekend when we were targeted by an Indian call centre wanting to discuss the use of a computer software package. During the first of these calls, all of which my young son took, we were told we owed the company money for using this service, which we did not, and, and then they were told not to call back again, but they did so on multiple occasions. Eventually, they admitted we owed nothing at all, but then in a bizarre uh, twist, we were pleaded with, and I mean literally pleaded with, to purchase the software at a price of $29.99. When my son refused the person on the other end, went a stage further in the begging process, telling him that where we came from, $29.99, was a sum we could easily afford. The thing is, my stroppy 18-year-old son had enough about him to stand his ground, but how many people might have been browbeaten into purchasing internet security they simply don't need, in the same way Liam MacArthur's constituent was persuaded to buy broadband when she doesn't have a computer? The firms making these nuisance calls are absolutely unrelenting. Two weeks ago, my home was called twice in the space of 20 minutes by the same energy supplier trying to persuade us to move to them. We have also in recent months discovered how unwise it is to offer any encouragement to these firms of offering PPI services. My wife, she tells me out of interest, told one to send out a pack for her to look over. A big mistake. Thereafter, she was called repeatedly four times on one particular afternoon by employees of the company concerned seeking to discuss how they might take forward her case. This sort of nonsense along with those calls which when you answer the phone disconnect is at best irritating and why should we have to contend with this in our own homes? But beyond that there's a deeply sinister, uh, sinister side to this issue. Citizens advice tell of people being scammed for hundreds of pounds at a time as a consequence of cold calling. Indeed, the CAB tell me that they've been told of people receiving calls from fraudsters claiming to be from the CAB and asking for money. Presiding officer, I've based my contribution today to this debate, which William MacArthur is to be commended for securing, on personal experience. But, but I'm not the kind of person to be exploited. My stroppy 18-year-old is an even stroppier father when it comes to receiving cold calls. And I've also managed to resist the temptation to furnish that nice-sounding chap from Nigeria who I've never met but who wants to give me thousands of pounds with my bank details. But particularly in these difficult economic times, there are vulnerable people out there who can all too easily be preyed upon. For that reason, I fully endorse the call for more to be done in this area. Of course, this is essentially a Westminster issue. And as we've heard, Liam MacArthur's uh, MP colleague, Mike Crockett, is campaigning there to have the powers of the relevant authorities enhanced. I think we would all, I'm sure, wish him well in that regard. Many thanks. Now call on Mary Scanlon to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, presiding officer. I couldn't help thinking about Neil Forsyth's book on uh, Bob Servant's emails when I was listening to... Uh, uh, Graham Day. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Liam MacArthur for securing this debate, uh, my fourth speech of this afternoon. Uh, the problem highlighted today is not new, and it is something that I, I suddenly realised we've almost become accustomed to. So it's very much deserving of debate due to the stress and indeed the fraud that can result. 
Uh, and I'd also realised that uh, many of the phone calls I'd made recently, I'd started leaving a telephone message which would be interrupted to say, oh, it's you. I thought it was one of those nuisance callers. So people are actually stopping answering their telephone. But even more concerning, one of my neighbours in Inverness recently bought a new phone uh, because she said there was consistently no one on the line when she picked the phone up. She got BT to check the line, so the line was OK. She obviously thought the phone was faulty. Uh, when this continued, uh, no one at the end of the line with the new phone, she then thought she might be getting checked out by potential burglars. And when I told her about nuisance calls, she was reassured that she'd already been seriously stressed and she'd already spent a considerable amount of money that was unnecessary. And like Graham Day, I get my fair share of cold calls, which can range from uh, payment protection plan, free new kitchens, free double glazing, free solar energy. In fact, one evening I was told of the fortune that I could make by selling the sunshine energy in Inverness to the national grid. Uh, however, what's been happening in Orkney is very distressing, with callers pretending to be part of a government initiative to help people in financial difficulty write off their debts, which of course leads to people giving their bank details. Um, I uh, signed up to TPE to stop nuisance calls, but it didn't make a blind bit of difference. And in researching for this debate, I now understand why. The telephone preference does not cover recorded messages. Uh, not even Sean Connery, when he personally called me last year uh, to ask me to, or told me that I should be voting SNP. TPS doesn't cover market research. No, I certainly did not. Even Sean Connery couldn't persuade me of that. TPS doesn't uh, cover recorded messages, market research, robocalls, whatever that is, or overseas nuisance calls. If you're registered with TPS, the burden is on the individual to identify and report nuisance callers. But try getting the number and try getting the name of the company. It's impossible. However, I also found some websites offering to eliminate nuisance calls completely. And I thought, well, that's fabulous. I'll raise that in the debate. Uh, however, this comes at a cost of £40 or £48 for a year or a one-off cost of £60 or £100. Basic protection is free, but only protects against unsolicited sales calls and junk mail from UK companies. So given the number of overseas call centres, this is of little help. And I'm now even so suspicious that I don't know whether these websites are an answer or indeed if it's someone just cashing in on another scam. I commend the work done at Westminster by Liam MacArthur's colleague Mike Crocker, which has attracted cross-party support. His motion describes the current legislation around cold calling via people's homes and mobile phones as confusing and overcomplicated and goes on to say he believes that people should be able to guarantee their privacy in a simple and effective way. Not too much to ask. The House of Commons Library is my final point. They have outlined the action taken over the years, including in 2010, the increase in the financial penalty available to Ofcom from 50,000 to 2 million. And I hope that following this debate, if people can find who's calling them, including Sean Connery, uh, could pa perhaps report it to Ofcom. There's also powers that have been revised in 2003, again in 2008. But I think, uh, presiding officer, the figure that I found most alarming was that 22% of the UK population have experienced silent calls on their landlines in the last six months. So surely proof that more is needed to address this increasing problem. Thank you very much. Perhaps we need to get Dr. No on to the case. Now call on Roderick Campbell, after which we'll move to the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate Liam MacArthur for bringing this issue to the Chamber and for his well-considered opening speech. And I also acknowledge the contribution of the Sunday Post to this debate, and I hope for Mr Mark Griffin's sake that he thinks time spent in this debate is time well spent. We have no doubt all been affected by nuisance calls at some point. Indeed, some of us may feel that we've had an inordinately large share of the quarter of a billion cold calls that Scots receive every year. There are many occasions when I avoid answering my phone at home if I don't recognise the number, such as the pervasiveness of the problem. 
and that's not to mention nuisance texts. I received a text myself on a night out last Friday, yet again regarding missold PPI. And uh, if I had the number of accidents, companies seem to think I'd have to be an extremely unlucky person indeed. Unsolicited calls and texts are at best annoying. Many people have the confidence to ignore calls from unidentifiable numbers or to hang up on unwanted sales calls or to delete unsolicited texts. But as Liam MacArthur rightly highlights in his motion, there are many people who don't have that confidence, particularly older, more vulnerable people. And cold calls can make their life very difficult indeed. I've had a significant amount of constituency case correspondence relating to unwanted phone calls. One man who contacted me described the calls as a plague. I have every reason to believe that's true of many people's experience, not to mention the real irritation of the silent calls. Simply switching off or ignoring calls is often not an option. Millions of people depend on their phone for genuine communications. Presiding officer, the telephone preference service is one way to limit incoming calls. The Information Commissioner's Office is responsible for the regulation of the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, 2003. That's the statutory guidelines concerning the communication of marketing materials by phone, text, email and fax. Regulation 21 does give teeth to the preference service, which prevents marketeers from making unsolicited calls to people registered on the preference service. As for the problem of identity, Regulation 24, as has been referred to already, requires that callers must identify themselves and provide a business address or free phone number on request. However, the role of the ICO is limited. It can only act on complaints in instances where the, where the caller is identifiable. UK-based, and as Maureen Watt suggested, that's a problem. And where the recipient is registered with the TPS or can prove they ask the callers not to contact them, as Mary Scanlon has referred to. So it's quite a difficult test. So what other options are there? I've contacted BT on behalf of constituents to obtain information on their own procedures. BT advise customers to report the source of the call to their landline if it can be traced to their own nuisance calls bureau. I've also discovered that many of the major UK mobile networks operate their own nuisance or malicious call bureau. O2, Orange, T-Mobile, Vodafone, Virgin and Tesco are a handful of the service providers who offer such a service. Clearly, these service providers must operate within the constraints, just as the ICO must do. And accordingly, while those services are welcome, there is a lack of uniformity in procedure across the board. I therefore fully understand the demand that Liam MacArthur has identified for a clear, simple method of reporting nuisance calls and texts across the board. And the purpose of the Liberal Democrat campaign is commendable. But ultimately, the powers required to make any substantial changes in this area lie with Westminster. The Liberal Democrats want to make a real difference. May I suggest they should be having a word in the ears of their UK government colleagues at Westminster, even if no doubt the Minister concerned would be happy to support their efforts. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Minister Fergus Ewing to wind up this debate on behalf of the government. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Lee MacArthur for bringing forward to a debate to this chamber, which is a very real concern to a very large number of people throughout Scotland and indeed the UK. Uh, and I'm grateful to all members who have participated in this debate from, uh, uh, from all parties represented here this evening uh, and uh, would echo and endorse the explanations they've given of the nature of nuisance calls and the problems they cause. Uh, mostly, of course, the problems are of a minor nuisance nature. I think that must be acknowledged. Um, but in some cases, as many members have pointed out, these can be very much more serious matters. Uh, as, ha as many members have pointed out, uh, that individuals have been encouraged uh, by uh, very persuasive people to part with money, to enter into contracts which plainly were onerous and unnecessary, unwanted and unwise. I myself have encountered this and they're extremely difficult to unravel, even if the law is on your side after the ink is dry in the contract or rather the, the, the deal, is, deal is done over the phone. This can cause very real hardship and especially I think for senior citizens for whom these ostensibly plausible calls are a particular concern, particularly those senior citizens who are alone, who uh, welcome human contact perhaps and I think the, the act of defrauding people in that situation is uh, particularly uh, 
to be deplored. And I think members have made the points very well uh, today. Not everyone, presiding officer, I think we will all agree, is as stroppy as the Day family have uh, openly boasted about being this evening. And not everyone has the resilience of character as uh, Mary Scanlon has shared with us this evening to resist the blandishments of Mr. Connery. <laughs> um, so I, I thought that, it, that, as many members have said, that it's right to point out the, the power over this matter, the legislative power, rests with the, the Westminster Parliament. And the Data Protection Act 1998, the DPA, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations 2003 are the most relevant pieces of legislation the Ministry of Justice, uh, south of the border, has policy responsibility for the Data Protection Act and the Department for Culture, Media and, Support, uh, and Sport has responsibility for the um, PEC, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. Um, but both pieces of legislation are in fact administered and enforced by the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, for which the Ministry of Justice is the sponsor department. And the, the powers are, of the ICO are drawn from the Data Protection Act. I should point out that the Information Commissioner in Scotland has no responsibility for this issue, just to avoid any doubt about the matter. The ICO in England is, is accountable to Westminster, and I think it's fair to point out, useful to point out, that the ICO has powers to take formal action against those who breach the both acts, and these powers include the ability to conduct audits, to serve an enforcement, to compel an organisation to take action to bring about compliance with the DPA and serve a civil monetary penalty up to a maximum presenting officer of £500,000. And the ICO can prosecute those who commit criminal offences under the DPA and reports to Parliament under Section 52. Um, two. And also unsolicited text messages, which have been mentioned by some members, are also covered by the PECR and sending such messages requires prior consent unless a consumer has provided their mobile telephone number in the context of the purchase of a product or service. And many of us, I think, try to take care when signing a contract to tick the box saying we do not wish to receive calls. And I think that's a sensible thing to do, but otherwise one is bombarded. Yes, of course. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister for uh, taking an intervention. I fully recognise that uh, the, the responsibility for, uh, for, for this issue largely uh, rests with Westminster. But I think I was very interested in a number of comments that were made, not least uh, some of the examples being given by Roderick Campbell about the steps that can be taken uh, short of any change in the rules as they currently stand. Uh, and perhaps the, the public awareness of those steps is, is insufficient at the moment. Is there perhaps a role here for, for Scottish Government in terms of the contact it has with many of these vulnerable groups to heighten awareness of the steps that, that can be ta even, taken even now? Minister? Uh, well, yes, I think we all have uh, the power to, to do that. Liam MacArthur, by bringing forward this debate, is serving that purpose. All of us, by participating in it, are doing that. I think we do have the ability to convey messages uh, and uh, we, we do do that, and I think this debate will, will help toward that end. Uh, and uh, I, I'm delighted towards that end to, to join in the calls of those presenting officer who recognise the excellent work carried out by the Sunday Post, who I think more than any other newspaper, so far as I'm aware, have taken up this issue and run with it. And I have with me here uh, one copy of the Sunday Post, which I, I thought I would share with members since I enjoyed reading it earlier, and on the front page, you'll see wrong number, 650 million silent calls a year, just one firm find. I think that's probably long enough for the Sunday Post uh, to see that we all recognise that they have carried out excellent work, as you would expect from uh, the foremost family newspaper presiding officer in this country. Uh, and they are to be praised for taking up an issue because an awful lot of the time that we feel that the press are being unduly negative or, or focusing on the, the misdeeds of politicians, uh, uh, heaven forfend. In this case, they have taken up a campaign and run with it. And I think it is a campaign that, where we can see more success. And in that respect, uh, I'm pleased to note that yesterday the ICO, the Information Commissioner, announced that it, was set, it is set to issue two penalties totaling over £250,000 to two illegal marketeers responsible for distributing millions of spam texts. This, I think, we would all agree, is the sort of action required to stamp out uh, this behaviour. Secondly, I understand that the ICO intends to publish 
a list of the most complained about companies in order to name and shame them. Uh, and whilst we recognize that there is a legitimate role for companies to market their services, and as Enterprise Minister, I do want to impede or prevent the legitimate marketing of good products. I think that would be wrong. There's a balance to be struck here. But I think the type of action that the ICO has announced is to be uh, welcomed, I think, by everybody in the debate uh, as we move forward. And I think exemplary fines are one of the most effective measures to tackle uh, this, this problem. Uh, so I welcome this debate, signing officer, this evening. I thank all members for the contribution. We would like to have the powers here to tackle the um, to tackle the issue more effectively ourselves, but recognising that there are steps being taken by the authorities down south, rather than be churlish about it or score points, I would say we welcome those powers and we would like to see more swift action. And I will arrange, presiding officer, for the text, the official report of this debate to be sent to the relevant UK ministers with a letter from myself drawing attention to the fact that this debate has, I think, reflected very well the concern of the public regarding these matters north of the border as they are concerns south of the border. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes this debate and I now close this meeting of Parliament.